Hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, my name is Mary Yusevich, and welcome to the second Ask Me Anything. I am the one of the founding board members of NUI, which was launched over 12 years ago, with uh, Judy Chang as our first president, who I want to send a big congratulations to her as the new undersecretary of EOEA in Massachusetts. Um, from those humble beginnings, we are here today um, with a distinguished guest on Ask Me Anything with Cheryl LaFur, former commissioner, chair of FERC, and now board of directors of ISO New England. Um, Cheryl, it's wonderful to have you today. I'm honored to call you a friend and also I've admired everything that you have done throughout your career. Um, from the humble beginnings of which are not so humble, but uh, going from Ropes and Gray's law firm to CEO of Grid, then um, on to FERC, and then now at a fellowship at Columbia University. And also recently, I, I also saw you were going to be on the board of directors of uh, Beth Israel. So incredible, incredible career. I just wanted, before we get started to asking some questions of Cheryl, I just want to talk about a little bit about the Ask Me Anything and also honor, uh, recognize our sponsors. Um, the Ask Me Anything is just one of the series of conversations that NUI is hosting with a number of critical, incredible female leaders in the energy and environmental field. AMA events occur regularly in the second Wednesday of the month so please mark your calendars. If you're not already subscribed to our newsletter, definitely make sure you head to our website, which is newy.org, to get on the list and keep uh, abreast of all the different speakers. And, and I would encourage you all to join NUI, uh, especially supporting us during these COVID-19 times. We greatly appreciate it. And also on behalf of everyone at NUI, I want to extend a huge thank you to our annual event sponsors, Eversource, First Light, and Robinson and & Cole, who not only make these in-person events possible, but support continued NUI programming in the new virtual space. So I cannot thank them enough. We wouldn't be here today without their support. The NUI board launched its AMA um, series on the outset of COVID-19, global pandemic is a way to provide our members and community with a way to connect with leading women in energy and environment, a chance to expertise, and pretty much the full warning that it's ask me anything. We hope that today's event will be interactive and conversational, and if you look um, on your screen, there is on the bottom, it's an area that says the Q&A. That is where you will put your questions. And after uh, a short introduction with Cheryl, we are basically spending the time just taking your questions and asking Cheryl of them. So please um, feel free to go ahead and find the Q&A section and um, Put down there a question that you want to ask um, of the thing of Cheryl and the community. Um, we have the next thing, the next speaker we have coming up is from National Grid on pipeline safety. We also have a former CEO of Avon Grid, uh, Sarah Burns, who is now on a board of directors of Avon Grid. We have our one of our signature events coming up in July. Um, Women's Shaping the Agenda, which is going to be exciting to hear from Alicia Barton from NYSERDA CEO. And then we have another Ask Me Anything with Amy DeFore. So it's, as you can see, we have a fantastic lineup and I think it's going to be great. But I am really excited about this particular Ask Me Anything with Cheryl LaFer. Welcome, Cheryl, to our second Ask Me Anything. How are you today? I'm very good, thank you. I think I'm yes. unmuted and haven't screwed anything up. Thank you so much, Mary. Well, um, sure, it's, um, it's great to have you virtually. This is fantastic. Um, you know, we are so honored to have you as somebody that we can go to. And you have always been the type of person that you can ask any question you never think of them as anything like stupid. There's no stupid questions. There's no 
uh, question that's not uh, willing to thing. I know that on the ISO board, there might be a few questions that you might have to say, I can't basically answer that directly, but you're so wonderful at least giving us some parameters to help us where we can find information and how we can basically learn on our own as well. So thank you, thank you for this kind of a format. We can't thank you enough. So I'm gonna turn it over to you to let you just give us a little taste of how you got to where you are today, especially for our young professionals. We're really very much supportive of diversity, inclusion, and trying to get young uh, women involved in this, these two powerful industries. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Cheryl, so you can give us a little background. Well, thank you so much, Mary. And uh, before I forget, thank you to Judy, uh, congratulations. I wanna add my congratulations to Judy Chang. Very exciting news about her. Um, I'm sorry that my image, which I thought was gonna be on the screen, but I guess that'll happen by magic, um, is a little bit dark. Um, I think you're still on the screen, Mary, but I don't know how you want to do it. But I'm sorry, my image is a little bit um, not perfect. Um, oh, I think it looks great. It really well, does. Mary went me. through a whole bunch of um, things I had done, but no one ever accused me of being a tech whiz. Um, so uh, no one ever accused me of being a tech whiz. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about my career and how I got where I am. Um, to kick things off, I apologize to anyone who heard this at last year's Nui Gala or any other event. Um, I'll try to at least do a very short version um, so you don't have to hear it all over again. Um, like a lot of people in my generation, I got into energy more or less by accident. Um, after law school, I went to a law firm to make money to pay off my loans and ended up staying eight years. I did all kinds of litigation, but no energy. After I didn't make partner and after my first child was born, who's now almost 35, which is kind of amazing, I got a part-time job at the electric company, the late great New England Electric System, which is now part of National Grid. I, I truly thought that like the big time part of my career was over when I didn't make partner, but I thought I'd go to the electric company for a couple of years and figure it out from there. Um, and I found out very quickly, as I think a lot of people on this call have found out, that I really loved working in energy, especially issues at the intersection of energy and the environment. I ended up staying more than 20 years in a succession of roles of increasing responsibility. So fast forward in 2006, I found myself as the acting CEO of US CEO of National Grid when our CEO left, and they were doing a search for a permanent CEO. And at that time, I really wanted the job to the extent that I really didn't figure out what I would do if I didn't get the job. Well, I didn't get the job. And I ended up taking an early retirement from the electric company. I was only 52. And I kind of bounced around or flailed around for a couple of years out of energy. And when my non-compete clause ended and I could get back in energy, I started networking to get another energy job. Um, as many people have heard me say, in September 2009, I got an unexpected cold call from the Obama White House asking if I wanted to be considered as a FERC commissioner. And I said, yes. Um, it turned out someone I had networked with had put my name on a list that she gave the White House and that's how they got my name. It took me several years, um, took me a long time later um, to figure out that Senator Olympia Snow, who was then the Senator from Maine, had gotten a promise from the administration to get a commissioner from New England because she was mad at FERC about some hydro case or something. So that promise was lucky for me. Um, I started in FERC in summer of 2010 and I had an amazing nine years. It was and remains a fascinating time to be in energy with so many changes in the nation's energy mix and tough issues on markets, infrastructure, grid security. I love having a team again, being part of a team. I love meeting people around the country. Um, my nine years were not without drama. I went from commissioner to acting chairman to chairman to commissioner to acting chairman to commissioner again. But um, overall, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Um, I apologize if you've heard me say this before, but it is really true. If I had a life motto, you know, when they interview people for magazines, Vanity Fair, even people, they say like, what's your model? It would be, life is a movie, not a snapshot. Everyone has ups and downs and twists and turns. 
and you can't judge yourself in your low moments, which I think I can generalize women are a little more inclined to be hard on themselves sometimes, and you never know what's coming next. Um, I left FERC in last August. A million people told me, don't make any decisions. Take six months and just chill and get back to this in the spring. But fortunately, I didn't listen to them or I would have been making decisions in the middle of a pandemic. Um, what happened, I did, um, the first role I took on was to be on the board of ISO New England, which I've really enjoyed. Um, and I just started last week, is it just last week? As a distinguished visiting fellow, what a title at Columbia. I spent all day trying to get my Com Columbia laptop set up and it's still not working right. But as I said, I'm not a tech whiz. I, have, um, I, I did go back on the advisory board at Beth Israel. I'm doing a little work for Joe Biden. I'm saying yes to way too many things, but we knew he is not one of them. This is the thing I should have said yes to. Um, so the title of today is Ask Me Anything, and I'm happy to take questions about my career or career family issues, about FERC, about DC and politics, about any energy or climate issues. I just don't want to get in the weeds on specific ISO New England issues that are being argued about at Neepool that are still in, you know, in gestation. Um, that's just, we can talk about that another time, but this isn't the right forum sure. for that. But other than that, fair game, and I well, will turn it over to Mary. When they, when we launched this series, I said to everybody um, at NUI, Cheryl LaFer, because she is the person you can literally ask anything, and she always has a response. Oh, I mean, and I've yeah. known you for many years from the time of when New England Power owned Salem Harbor Station, and you worked with my husband on the sale of that to, um, you know, to my time, my career, and it's been wonderful uh, getting to know you. And I always tell people the story. Nui was in your time that we were all celebrating your success was a time Judy and I drove home back to Salem, Beverly, and um, we said, we've got to keep this going, and, and it was the birth of Nui, which fast forward, here we are today. Well, I'm so, happy to be a part of that history, and I, I do associate drinking wine with being at Nui, but I have not had any today, because I figured it will give me a better chance, not until after the questions are over. We we'll definitely so, have a uh, wine and cheese right. section at the end. Um, well. <laughs> You have definitely inspired people. We have up to 74 participants um, right now on the webinar. So welcome everyone. I am looking at the Q&A and actually someone um, asked a question that I was gonna ask you too. So I'm just gonna combine it with my question, which is um, carbon pricing. Something that I know you and I've had millions of discussions on and COVID-19, if anything has demonstrated to us what it's like with um, seeing a reduction in carbon and to the environment. And I've heard you talk about, hey, we have a mechanism currently, it's called Reggie. Why can't we make Reggie the, the vehicle to do carbon pricing? So this person asked, what's your thoughts on carbon pricing and how will it change the market? So I was thinking because we have, one thing about new is we have people who are super experts on the subject to people that are just entering into this industry. And you're so good about explaining things where you won't lose us and you bring along the rest of them. Can you give us an understanding of how, when you say Reggie is a mechanism that could do this and give us a, your thoughts on carbon pricing? Well, thank you. Um, I guess just to start from the beginning, um, it is my view that if the goal of a lot of the changes we're making right now is to reduce the climate impact of the energy system, then setting a goal around what you, you know, not setting a specific goal, like we need these seven kinds of renewables, whatever. If the real goal is to reduce carbon, the most efficient way to achieve that goal is some kind of system that values carbon. My first choice would be a national cap and trade kind of limit for carbon as they tried to get passed in Waxman Markey in 2009. And we have um, had national cap and trade systems for sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide and other things, pollutants that we were trying to reduce. Um, because I think because it's a global problem, the wider the scale of the solution, the better. Um, if we couldn't have um, 
And the other advantage of carbon pricing, I'm sorry, besides just finding the most the cheapest ways to reduce the carbon the fastest, because that's what markets do, is some kind of carbon valuation would be consistent with the competitive markets, which use um, economic valuation to choose which resources get, get picked and which resources run. And I think that um, that would be a, a solution that was very compatible with the benefits of markets to customers. You can't have national carbon pricing, which given the president and the Senate right now would be very difficult to get. We didn't even get it when Obama was president, which didn't pass the Senate. Um, if you can't have national carbon pricing, then regional carbon pricing, I think, would be the next best choice. And one thing that's unique about the New England region is it is part of the only regional carbon pricing structure we have now. California has one, but it's just California. Reggie has... I should know, is it almost like a dozen states now because they have added New Jersey back in and Virginia and Pennsylvania are in the process. I shouldn't have said New Jersey. Virginia and Pennsylvania are the process of going in. And the advantage of Reggie is that what I have heard state regulators in New England say is that they are concerned about introducing carbon prices in the New England market because it would be controlled by FERC and it would be federally controlled. And Reggie is set up as something within state control. So it's an already existing mechanism that was negotiated a long time ago among the states that you could use Reggie. Problem is Reggie only sets carbon at like $5 a ton approximately. And some of the choices that the states are making for offshore wind and all are paying considerably more than five dollars a ton for carbon if you let the reggie price go up a little that would be a mechanism that um was consistent with the market but uh the advantage of reggie that i pointed to is it's state controlled and it will be ultimately in control it will be ultimately in the control of the reggie member states what they do with that and also Last thing I'll say about Reggie is you could potentially have a New England zone and another zone. It doesn't have to be just one price, but that's all within the control of the states and that's where it belongs because it's a state mechanism. So Cheryl, if the Nui women want to get involved in making this a reality, can you give us some pointers of what we need to do? I mean, do we have to get, you know, who should we go to? Who should we, um, solicit advice for it and solicit joining in on this band reggie or carbon change well, carbon and, and and using yeah. maybe reggie as a mechanism i mean i gave a a talk in, in my college class earlier this week and for people who are concerned about climate change i think the first thing everyone can do is vote vote at the national state and local level for people who i mean i would just put that on, I know that people have a lot of reasons they vote for different candidates, but I'd stick that on your list as you're evaluating candidates. Um, but I also think particularly in this audience of energy professionals, being involved in the energy discussion in the regions would be a good way to make sure that um, climate improvement happens and happens in a way that makes sense. And I think the Reggie, there's a board of Reggie that is mostly it's like mostly um, commissioners or other energy policymakers in the different states would be good people to be involved in in your respective circles. Okay, well, thank you. So I'm going to switch between technical questions and topics on the industry to some personal career uh, questions. So I play back and forth. And, and can Kelly you see Smith, me on your screen, because I can you see me on your screen? Yes, I can, I can see you it. on my screen. So I just want to make sure I didn't. There was nothing I needed to do to. Okay. No, I can Somebody see. Somebody else is controlling that. Okay. So Kelly Smith asked a question. Um, she says, Cheryl, thank you for joining us. Have there been any positions or experiences throughout your career that have been formative in establishing your leadership style? Oh gosh. Um. I would say to the extent I have a leadership style that I can kind of identify, a lot of it was developed in the my early days in management under John Rowe at New England Electric System. I really learned a lot from him. I mean, he used to say leadership, 
I mean, it's so many things he used to say, I just say all the time, like leadership is all about how you make people feel and people feeling that their individual contribution is critical to the success of the whole. Management is something different. Management is putting people in the right jobs and making sure you have enough money. But leadership is more the way you make people feel. Um, he also uh, used to say um, that you should never be afraid to take a chance on someone you think could do a job, even if they weren't the obvious pick, which is something I've tried to follow. But um, geez, God knows our society still has a long way to go on diversity. And so does our industry, not just gender diversity, but racial diversity, which is in so much on people's minds right now. Um, and I think just some of the more small ways like using humor and situations and how you relate to people. I think a lot of them were built in during that first 10 years that I led people at New England Electric. Um, I also think when I was acting chairman at National Grid, I mean, acting commissioner, okay, try it third time, acting CEO, there have been so many acting things. Um, <laughs> when I was acting CEO at National Grid, was such a weird time of not knowing what my future was and having to take the company through a merger and so forth. And I really learned a lot then about kind of just moving forward that I never thought, I hoped I would never have a chance to apply it again, but it was very relevant when I was acting chairman the first time at the commission. I didn't know if I'd be renominated and I was just trying to keep the work going. So I think all of us bring things from our past life that they use as a lens or without even reeling it. I know most people don't wake up and say, oh, this reminds me so much of when I had X challenge because they're so involved in what's there in front of them that day. They're not thinking about something that happened. But I think what, what we've been through in our personal lives and in our work lives does kind of come with us to the next challenge. Well, I think that's, ex that's absolutely true. And um, it is, people do make an impression in your life and they do stay with you. So I thank you for sharing that. And I love some of those quotes. I'm going to go back now to um, asking you a technical question. This comes from Mary O'Donnell, who is basically um, in distributive baseload renewable energy technology. And her question is a very interesting one. It has to do with adaptation of the nation's energy market instruction, infrastructure advanced technology. She's basically saying, how do we get new distributive technology become a reality? How do we take something, and this would be, I'd love to hear this answer too, because I deal with this every day at UMass Lowell. How do you take something that's conceptual, developed in the universities or in labs, and then apply it and then become reality to the consumer to use to get to, take, to those advanced technologies? Um, I just want to add something to my last answer and then I'll give this one. I'm not just sure. for time, but I gave a whole speech once that I wish I still had about how everything, it was like one of those books you see at the register. Everything I learned about management was from being a mother, which is not a hundred percent true, but it's not completely irrelevant either. I had plenty of good examples. Um, it was easy. Speech oh no, I, I, used, yeah. Yeah, I used to teach uh, a management course at Endicott and Emmanuel college. And I, and it was right when I was just starting to be a mother and I said, Everything you need to know, learn from a mom's relationship to her kids. That's absolutely right. So um, it's a good answer. Technologies, distributed technologies are not exactly just theoretical now. I mean, we do have had for years um, relied on energy efficiency for decades. That is by definition distributed. It's how people use energy right at their home, as well as various forms of demand response going all the way back to the radio signals that turned people water, people's water heaters on and off like 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and now with the distributed solar, of course, really having reached critical mass already, I think, and the growing distributed batteries, we do have a lot to learn from of what happened before. I think there's a couple different levels. Um, The things, Burke had done a lot of work when I was there on trying to make sure that technologies that were distributed and especially storage technologies could somehow participate in the wholesale markets collectively. That you could, you, they wouldn't be barred from participating in any service they were capable of providing. And Burke has made a lot of progress and all of the RTOs, including ISO New England, done a lot of work in complying with that. Um, the next 
frontier that FERC did not, has not finished um, is what about really distributed things like home to home behind the distribution feeder, you know, on the distribution feeder right down to the home level. How do you aggregate those and let the power flow the other way? And that's going to require operational changes in the way that the distribution control center and the transmission control centers talk to each other to make sure that it's safe and um, that the, you know, that the distribution company knows what's going on. I think actually some of the New England states along with New York and California are pretty far ahead to the extent anyone's ahead on figuring those out, but there's a lot more we need to figure out operationally about how you make that work. Beyond that, I think it's important that the markets send the right signal of what's valued. And I don't want to talk about a lot of pending cases, but like ISO New England filed the um, energy security improvements, which is a new day ahead um, reserve product. And we've seen a lot of um, the markets look at ramping products or various forms of like flexibility products so that if you're trying to get people to use their storage or their rooftops the most efficient way or the potentially someday aggregate their char ba car batteries to feed the grid, then the grid has to know what it's asking for. And that's very much a work in progress on, in every single American market of like, how do we value those services that we're gonna need? Um, because when, right now, um, if you have a big time wind load, which we don't yet hear in New England, but they do in MISO and ERCOT and so forth, and the wind comes down, Mostly now you ramp up natural gas to fill in because that's the by far the most right. um, accessible thing. But in theory, you could ramp up a bunch of car batteries, but you'd have to have all of the networking and all done to do that. And you'd have to be sending the signal of what you needed in that ramp so people would install what they needed to, to meet it. Well, you know, it's interesting. You talked about the energy security improvement, the ESI. I just wanted to give a shout out to another organization because I just did, uh, was part of a webinar that Nika did on that topic. So nika-ne.org, you can see it. It was today. Excellent one with ISO and uh, NEPOL and everybody on the call. So it was, it was a really good webinar. So if anybody wants more information on what you just mentioned, um, please go to that. I'm going to switch now to a personal question that someone had asked. If you had to recommend New England Women's Executive Network, other than NUI, which we recommend always, everyone should join NUI first and foremost. Patty Quinn says, what other groups are you a part of that you would recommend that women should get involved in? Oh my goodness. Well, right now I'm involved in NUI. I'm involved in WECI, which is the Women's Council on Energy and the Environment, which is Washington-based, but has people all over. Years ago, I was in the Energy Bar Association. Um, I, I, having just moved back to the region, I'm not an expert on all the local organizations. I would say, if you're part of a workforce, like if you're working on your own at home, that's different. Then you should probably seek out your, your local chambers and your different women's groups. But if you're part of the workforce, beyond a couple good quality things like NUI, I would see if there are affinity groups or women's groups either structured or informal within your own workforce. I mean, a lot of the groups I've been involved with have had, um, you know, I get things from Princeton and other places that I'm affiliated with in some way saying, hey, would you like to mentor someone? We'll assign you someone to mentor. And I mean, I'm not saying I've never done it, but it's like, hey, I got plenty of women to mentor right here. And men, I don't need to go like go online and get them. They're right there in my office and right there in my right. life. And I think people have networks right in their um, close at home that they should make sure they're kind of getting the most value from and really mm -hmm. being part of that network because that's right. a different kind of relationship. Yeah, and I encourage also women to go into non-energy, non-environment work for us because is, um, we need to educate people about energy. Um, yeah. It's very few people outside of this bubble that we're in understands it. So I encourage people all the time, join other groups and then become the subject expert on this and educate. And even not just to educate people about energy, whether it's women for Biden or um, a book club or whatever, people in other fields 
have a lot we can learn from. In fact, I actually think there are some other fields like education and hospitals right now that have come way further on women in the C-suite than mm -hmm. electricity and gas, to say nothing mm -hmm. of oil where women can't find the C-suite. I'm sorry, that's a slight <laughs> overstatement. But that was my impression when I was at FERC that electricity was like the farthest, but they weren't anywhere right. in precarity. And the oil was like the most male dominated, the ones who came to see me. Maybe that's, hopefully that's changing. But some of these other industries like high tech and um, academics and hospitals have so many female CEOs. So maybe we can learn from some of the people that are in, you know, yeah. we don't just learn from ourselves. Right, so we have a question here on tax credits, a hot topic for offshore wind developers. When is it widely reported that offshore wind is cheaper than fossil fuels? How do incentives and breaks play into both fossil and renewables? So it's all about the tax credits. Can you give us your thoughts on that? Well, I'm definitely not a tax expert, but my understanding is that for a large swath of industries, various tax credits have been put in place over the years to encourage investment. And a lot of the fossil investment tax credits that relate to extraction and mining are permanent. They're already like kind of embedded in the whole industry and the price. But for various reasons that relate to our um, fundamental disagreements around technologies and climate right now, the renewable tax credits have um, not been made permanent, like kind of get them at a sustainable level and keep them. It's been you know, for three years, then maybe a one year extension, then you fight about it and they backdate it for another three years. Um, and I guess I think um, tax policy is a way to help guide investment. So tax credits from everything I can tell have had a beneficial effect, but it seems like this structure of having them for a couple of years and fighting about it again, and then figuring out on December 26th, you're gonna renew them again is a stupid way to do it in. It would be better to get them to some level that we could live with for a long time and just maybe have them there for longer, um, which I believe is what's happened in some of the more mature industries that their taxation is more. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, an, an excellent response. So now going back to a personal question, you mentioned Joe Biden. You said you're doing some work. Someone says, what are you doing for Joe? Well, no. Um, I haven't even read my emails, but I'm on the <laughs> executive council of the clean energy for Biden, like clean energy numeral for Biden, which is um, kind of a bunch of mid-level Obama people. Um, we're pretty far from the policy making apparatus, although in theory, we could have access to that. But it's, I guess if I understand the role of this group, when there's fundraisers, which are probably not gonna be Zoom calls, then people would be dispatched to go and make a talk briefly about energy and say how important energy should be to the election or how important climate should be. So, um, but uh, I went so to- the women on this- so I mean, so I, but this is new for me because I've, right. I've given money to a lot of candidates, but I've never been on any kind of committee, but I just feel um, this is such a critical election for climate issues right. um, that, you know, when they asked me to do it and I, I, when I was in Washington, I always felt like an outsider compared to the other people. It's like, well, they're all political types and I'm just me. And now that I got asked to do something, I said to my husband, well, I can't like keep complaining about being an outsider. Then when they asked me to do something, so well, I don't want to do that. Um, so I said I would do it, so. but I would say it's an exaggeration to say I've done work. Um, I went to one Zoom call so far and made a file and put all the links to all the things I'm supposed to look at. There's so this slack. is an important election. No, it's slack is right. There's like a Slack file. I never heard of a Slack file till two weeks ago. Now every organization I'm with makes you go to some Slack file. So if I am on this call today, if I'm on this webinar, and I want to also help in this election, but I, I feel like I have a connection with you. Is there any way that I could become part of your team? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I could I could go in my Slack file and send you a link. I think I I think there's a pretty large, I mean, I think I'm on like the executive council, whatever that means, but there's a whole group clean energy for Biden that's even bigger than the already bloated executive council. Um, well, we're going to make so, sure we post okay. how but they I mean, become yeah. part of this effort. You I don't, don't want this to become a political fundraiser because even though 
I'm doing this. I mean, I really do think that people are entitled to have different views and different political choices and all. And, um, and I also think some of the most interesting races, I mean, this is a pretty big national election, but in general, some of the school committee and all that are really, there's a lot of ways to be involved. Um, so now I'm gonna switch I'm back. Expert, since this is my first time. Well, well, being married to a former mayor, let me tell you, it was my first part of my whole life was, was politics, but I'm glad he's now in the private sector. Um, but is New England dropping the ball? Let's switch to hydrogen because it's, you know me, I've been talking about hydrogen for what, five or six years with you. And I love this question someone brought up is, is New England dropping the ball on green hydrogen? Um, why in Europe it's moving forward and it just seems to not be moving anywhere here in New England? Well, I certainly wouldn't say, I wouldn't accuse New England of dropping the ball because I think everywhere in the United States, the thought of repurposing our gas pipeline network for hydrogen and as a clean fuel is really just coming into primacy as far as I can see in the United States. In, I think, um, I heard someone say this, so I'll repeat it. Like the US put a lot of their energy in carbon capture and sequestration while um, Europe went right to the molecular, you know, carbon response with hydrogen and other new um, molecular ways to store the fuel. Um, that's such a fancy word, isn't it? But um, I would say that I don't think it's really commercial anywhere. So I don't think New England has dropped the ball, but I do think it's definitely worth exploring. Um, absolutely. I, it, when I worry about New England, it has not been like, oh my God, we're so slow on hydrogen. I do worry sometimes that New England's aspirations for climate improvement aren't matched by a willingness to accept infrastructure. The long list of things that have not been built because people don't want a line to go through somewhere, people don't want to look at a windmill from their summer home or whatever. I'm hoping that we're in a new stage now and the current generation of projects, some of them are going to be built, but we have, I mean, when you really look at what percentage of energy comes from renewables, New England is not a leader. When you look at what the goals are for how much should New England is a leader. They have very big aspirations. So I think um, it's gonna, we're really in the critical phase of getting those things built now, getting through the various obstacles of the Bureau of Energy, um, o Ocean Energy Management, and so forth. I'm not saying New England's behind. I just think it's been a hard place to build things. And could you use the existing infrastructure that's there? I mean, is there gonna be a transition from natural gas to hydrogen? Do you see that or not? You mean the existing infrastructure for hydrogen or for electricity? For, for could, could you use the existing natural gas infrastructure? I am not hydrogen? an expert. You should get someone to come in now that's an expert on hydrogen, but I have been told if there's an, if, I mean, if there's, if the leak control is enough, you can repurpose some of it. I don't think you just flip a switch and say, oh, this is now a hydrogen infrastructure. The compressor stations are now going to be hydrogen stations. I, hydrogen is flat, flammable and you need to have a very secure system and also I think, but you, m my understanding is you could repurpose some of the infrastructure, but it okay. would require some, I believe, although I'm not in my area of expertise, would require retrofitting to take hydrogen. Well, we'll definitely have to make that a new hot topic for another webinar. Getting back to more personal questions, how do you address organizations that are characterized as the old boy network and get over that mentality and get them to understand that that is dead and we're trying to move on to a more diversified inclusion? And this is, believe it or not, Cheryl, this is a commitment that the board at NUI has made to deal with DNI, and so we'd love to have your thoughts on this. Um, well, I actually um, just wrote a piece for the U.S. Energy Association on kind of what works. Let's see if I can. I don't know if I have it here. What works in helping improve the diversity of a workforce? Um, this is obviously something a company can do or an individual can do in their sub part of the organization. The single most important thing to improve diversity is just to put 
women or people with other that represent other forms of diversity in jobs. Um, you can have all the committees and focus groups and all, but there's nothing like an example that someone can see and say, hey, there is a female vice president or whatever. Um, and then once people are in jobs, I think organizations should help to develop them, both men and women, by moving them around and giving them opportunities to grow in the organization. Um, I think that is the single most important thing that has to happen. Beyond that, I do think some of the other strategies like affinity groups for women, particularly so that if there's women in a part of an organization that is very male dominated, might not have another other female colleagues, they can meet others through that group. Um, and uh, being involved in organizations like NUI, um, Columbia has a women in energy program I wanna get involved with that's supposed to be very good. For, um, being involved in organizations like that can help. And I, and I also think another way that organizations can make a difference is by having good work family policies for everyone. But certainly in my generation, there was a whole phalanx of people who came of age when I did that got really good jobs out of school. And when they got in their thirties, they just kind of fell off the track because it was too hard. And they are not the CEOs now, or now we're, now they're retired maybe, but when they were in that age that if they had mm -hmm. been going up all along, they, that generation, it did not happen. I think it's still more of an, if I had to generalize, more of a career issue for women than for men, um, how you navigate those childbearing years in your 30s. And I think flexibility around that is really important. As far as women who are um, not, choosing people for jobs and can't set up how or can't choose the maternity leave at, or paternity leave at their company. I just think never being intimidated to go into a meeting, even if you're the only woman to join things that men are in, you don't necessarily have to golf if you don't want to golf, but if there's a thing that the guys are doing after work, that seems to be an informal network to just Invite yourself. Nothing is single sex anymore. It's more self-selection that right. keeps people out. You know, although that's another issue, at least when my kids were little, I could not do a lot of um, evening networking, but I chose my spots because you have to do some and try to yeah. be there. Well, I, and have uh, the courage that you can do it and speak up. Right, and hopefully one day we won't have this question about the old boy network. Switching back to- The old first. boys are dying off, but the young They're boys- dying are off. The young boys are kind of networked too, but no. Yes. Yeah. So what do you think about the direction of FERC in terms of, is it going, becoming more activist? Is it taking on a new role? You know, now that you're not part of FERC, you could be a little bit more open about, you know, what you see as the role of FERC. Well, I'm a big believer that an independent agency with hopefully not entirely political people who were chosen for their technical abilities or their life, you know, their career experience can play an important role because by being bipartisan and independent, they're not always just worried about, oh my God, if I don't decide this case this way, I'm gonna lose my job. They can try to look beyond and do what they need to do based on their experience. They're gonna do it for a while and then their term ends and maybe they won't do it anymore. But in the meantime, it can try to reach the best bipartisan decisions. Um, I would say in the first nearly six years that I was at FERC in the Obama administration, not everything was unanimous, but we had far fewer party line votes. I think maybe we were a little more incremental about some things and brought the Republicans along. We didn't think of it that way. We didn't think, oh, we need Republicans. It just didn't feel as partisan. Maybe we had just had really good people and they were not at all extremist. Um, well, maybe a couple were extremist, but I don't think Mueller and Spitzer were extremist in any way when I first got there. So we didn't sort of think, oh my God, we got a Republican vote. Most of the things just went out that way. Even mm -hmm. order number 1000 had a Republican vote, order 745 did. It just was not as partisan. I think what's really bothered me about FERC the last two years, or you know, including when I was in it, um, is that so many of the policy things, there has not been a 
attempt, at least not a successful attempt, to reach a bipartisan compromise. And they're going out, um, you, you know, when the when, when the commission was two to two, they either didn't go out or they went out if I voted with the Republicans and got them to move a little bit. But now that the commission is three to one, they're going out three to one. Not everything, but the policy things. And I think that that's how some agencies have been. The FCC has been that way in the NLRB, more or less, a lot of party line votes. But then when the White House switches, then you say, oh, we're going to get rid of those policies. Now we're going to make our part of those policies and put them out with party line votes. I think it would be way better, even if whichever side was in the majority didn't get as much as they wanted to get a compromise. And I feel that way about carbon pricing too. Even if the Congress could pass something and it wasn't all the way, it wouldn't be like the Green New Deal, but made a national policy, even if it was a compromise one, that would be so powerful to have that national policy. Um, so I'm a little disappointed that FERC has become so political. And I mm -hmm. hope, th there's no guarantee, even if the White House changes, that all of a sudden it's going to change. It could just be the opposite, that like now it's all party line votes the other way. And I think that would be unfortunate. I think yeah, that- Yeah, I have to agree with you. And uncertainty for business is a killer of business. So you, I agree. What did you so say? The next person asked you, this is like a little group therapy here, Cheryl. If you could go back and give advice yourself early in your career, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I'm tempted to say I would give myself the advice to be less anxious about everything, but I'm just not sure myself was ever capable of implementing that advice because that's how I'm um, wired. Let me try to think of something more profound. I think I would have more confidence that things were going to work out okay. I just spent so much time worrying, you know, that I was going to screw this up or this was bad or I was doing this bad or, you know, I mean, I, and I didn't, at least for many, many years of my life when my kids were little, I didn't have a long-term career plan. It was like, can we make it till Friday? Is someone picking up every day? Who's picking up? Can we get to Friday? Okay, now let's get to the next. We've beaten back the chaos, we say, for one week. Now let's get through the next week. I would tell myself to have a little more kind of confidence that things would be okay and carry myself with a little more confidence that I could do it um, than I had then. I think I was just a little too anxious about everything. Not really profound. I should think about that one. But, <laughs> but that's honest. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it, it's, hey, you know, it's interesting. And it's, I thought it was, I, I don't know if I could answer that question right now. I'd have to, I'd have to think about it. This is really like, perfect. We'll have to when I had my first child, the obstetrician said to me, the single most important advice I can give you is lose the weight right away. That's the easiest time to lose it. And then you won't put it on and whatever. And I thought to myself, well, I'm like really busy. I, Someday I'll have lots of time to lose weight. Well, now I do have lots of time to lose weight, but I'm still not. So, <laughs> yeah. Hey, and listen, it's always that way. We always put off what we think we can get done and, and we just run out of time. But before we run out of time, I do have another question regarding the industry. At early stage for consumer level guru, Thai solar, other generation, there was a limit of something like 12% that the grid could accept. Do you think that it's still that way? I mean, that we have limitations on this distributive energy that renewables can be accepted in the grid or has that changed? Is that out? Does that no longer? I thought, well, there used to be a rule. Gosh, this is, it was a part of the small generator interconnection um, policy at FERC. There used to be a rule at one time, you could only put like 10% solar on each, um, on each feeder. And it was the FERC rule had been like codified from a California rule. And then um, a lot of the states, even though that a lot of it was under state control, just took the FERC rule and made that the rule in the state. And then California changed their rule. I don't remember when they went up to 45% or much higher than 10%, but whatever, and said, that's obsolete. That was just done by a bunch of engineers who said, well, probably five is safe, so we'll double it and that'll be it. And, you know, to, or maybe 20 would probably be safe, so we'll only say 10. It was just kind of done on the back of an envelope. And we had a process at FERC 
maybe in like the 2013, 2014 timeframe. And I thought the new small generator interconnection did not set any strict quantitative limit. It could be done with the distribution company if there were specific reliability or safety issues on that line, but otherwise you could put more solar on. So um, I think it really is gonna come down to what's the robustness of the distribution network, how much can be fit, but I think the 10% the or 15% or whatever it was has gone bye-bye. And as far as there are days, big picture now, if you look at um, like ERCOT or SPP, there are days when it's a far majority you know, I mean, there's days yeah. when California is almost all solar at peak. So um, there are days when most of the um, the load is being carried by renewables. And we thought back in the 80s that was impossible. I Could agree. not work. Exactly. And then so things change as we keep on learning through technology. So Maureen Callahan has a great question for you. A book. When's your book coming out about your experience oh, in Washington? <laughs> it's going to be a tremendous oh. amount of. Well, when I spoke uh, at when I spoke at the Energy Bar Association like a year ago, and I did like my day not day by day, but kind of all the ups and downs and crazy things that happened at FERC. Somebody said you should make that a book. It's like, well, it would have like a really narrow readership, but they would really like it. Those ones, those few people that really cared. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about now, since I'm at Columbia, is like, how do I, I mean, how do I publish? I mean, I don't think I'm going to write like a law review article with 200 footnotes that take nine months to write. I mean, because that, I'm not sure who, but do I do op-eds or how do I, you know, how do well, I make you know, myself a part exactly. of the conversation? Well, the next person has a good question for you and he helps you write, um, Simon says, can you write the playbook of how we're going to get to net zero carbon emission by 2050? Like, what do we, you know, so that's 30 years from now. In 30 years, what do we all have to do to get to net zero carbon? Well, I will say, I mean, what I've been doing, I've done this speech a couple of times that I've said, there's three macro issues that are really hurting us as a country in getting, making the kind of progress the United States is capable of making on carbon reduction, given its resources, financial, technical, natural. Um, I think the first is that we have not agreed as a country that it's a problem or agreed on a goal. Um, and if you're not even trying to get there, no wonder you're not making maximum progress um, because there's not a national consensus. I mean, the European Union and Canada, a lot of places have like a goal for how they want to get, but we don't have a national goal. And now, for my money, even a compromise goal would be great. Some people think unless it's like the perfect goal, you shouldn't have it, but we don't have a national goal. And the second reason is related is that we're addressing the problem in a very disaggregated way because there's no national strategy. Every state has a strategy. Cities and towns have rules and strategies. Companies have their own strategies. And we're addressing a problem, you know, they, a lot of those um, entities don't have the control of all the mechanisms because they're regional or beyond to achieve that strategy. And we're not, we're doing it in a very disaggregated way. That's why I'm passionate about regional solutions if we can't get federal solutions. And the third thing is I think we have not accepted, um, there's a disconnect between what we want to do and how hard it's going to be and what we have to put up with to get it done. I mean, we can passionately favor clean energy until somebody wants to put a line through our yard or until, not our yard, but through our town until, um, until we have to change our own behavior. And I think there's been a political tendency to say this is all going to be really cheap and really easy, but transitions aren't cheap. It might be cheap on the other end once it's all up there, but it, takes time and money to solve problems. And I think we've not accepted that given the importance of the problem. But I mean, I think if the COVID thing shows anything, it shows if people buy into something, look at the change they can make in a short time. If they really believe, hey, we really need to do this thing. I'm going to really change my behavior. Well, Cheryl, this has been wonderful. And unfortunately, there's so many more questions. I have time for one more. And I am going to get, it's going to be a technical question or one about okay. your uh, work, but um, you've kept 75 people engaged and participating in a webinar. There's at least, a, at least another 15 questions I'm not, I'm, unfortunately couldn't get to, 
But and I'm going to ask you this one. Live when, ones and I'll see them all over a drink. Yeah. And I was going to say, and then, um, but what I'm going to do is we're going to capture these questions and, and possibly, you know, you can look through them and see if you can provide an answer. But Jennifer has asked, uh, she's a big fan of yours and she wants to really thank you for participating in this format. She said, have you heard about the New England Ratepayers Association request to FERC to create some sort of federal cap on net metering? So distributed solar would be compensated at the wholesale price of energy, not the retail price. Can you comment on this request? Hmm. Well, it's been talked about not New England ratepayers, but someone doing that for a while. I mean, I remember it came up at conferences I was at years ago because the some of the cases on which FERC based its policy that um, net metering wouldn't be FERC jurisdictional as long as it was like net positive at the end of the month, you know, that um, some of the station service cases have since been overturned or whatever. So it was kind of ripe for a relook. Um, I have to say when I was at FERC, I never went to work and said, oh my God, I hope this is the day someone challenges net metering. It was more like, I'm glad that no one has brought that. Um, I think if the I think it's going to for assuming FERC takes up the petition, it's going to force them to take a hard look at where they draw the line because the, as I said, some of the cases that they relied on the last time they looked at it in the early part of the century, you know, 2001 or 2004 or something, some of those cases are not good law anymore. They'll have to take a fresh look at it. But I think it would be very bad for state policy and for the distributed solar industry if the petition prevailed. As a policy matter, I think it would be very bad for um, small solar. And I have no idea if FERC is going to take it up. I mean. And, and of course, you're not there to drive the discussion. Like so in the dike, I miss you, know. you. And I'm not happy that like New England is attached to it. It's like, why couldn't it be the Oklahoma Association or something? But whatever, there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> no, <laughs> but you are going to be trailblazing in other areas for us. And I, again, on behalf of Nui, thank I you. can't thank you enough. We do have 15, I apologize to those that we did not get to. Um, but I want to say again, thank you to our sponsors, First Light Power, Robinson Concole, and Eversource for giving us this opportunity to have a conversation with Cheryl. If you love this format, which I think it's great. I mean, you get to ask questions of some of these top leading women. Our next one is with Sheila Morissette, who is going to be talking about pipeline safety from National Grid. That's June 24th. Please sign up for that one. Register today. Join Nui. Cheryl's right. It's a great organization. And getting someone like Cheryl LaFer on a call, sharing her thoughts with us today, just shows you how fantastic a group it is. And Cheryl, I'm glad you're back in New England. Well, and you. when I'm this too. whole COVID thing's over, we have to have our dinner with our husbands. Yeah, yes. and, but I mean, thank you again. It is easy to do these when you don't have to go anywhere, but I miss seeing you. I the know. People. I do miss, though, because you're, as anybody knows, Cheryl, her sense of humor is fantastic. And it's just a wonderful evening, always just hearing from you and your, your breadth of knowledge in this industry and your willingness to share are commendable. So thank you so much. Thank Cheryl. you really so much for all those kind words. Thanks everyone. Thank well, you. Everyone, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.